Over the next <clears throat> three weeks, we're going to talk about three letters, or three words that all start with the letter C. As you can see, the three C's that are up there, they kind of look like a cube. And, and this series is called The Three C's. And, uh, yeah, real original, huh? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I couldn't think of anything else to go with it, because, you know, it's, it's well, I've been praying, I've been here now a little bit over a year, and, and I've been talking to a lot of people in the church, and a lot of different things that... You know me, I, I like to see things done yesterday, right? You, you, you know, I don't move real slow, if you've noticed that. I don't like, I don't like to move slow. Sometimes I do. Uh, I, I don't really have a choice sometimes. And you know what, because God, i got to move with God, not move the way I want to move. i got to move the way God wants to do. And I've been seeing what's going on and, and, and getting to know all of you and getting to know our church. And one of the things I want to do is we, we need to have, God's impressed on me, we need to have an identity. Why, why are we here? What are we doing? Why, why do we do it? Do we just say things to say things do we have a purpose you know every great business in the world has ever become great they, they, they know exactly what their product is and they know exactly how to sell it an interesting thing is we ain't selling anything because it's free to come to jesus christ isn't that great you know and since so, so some of the best things in life are what well this is the best thing in life and we have it, and we have it all bottled up, and, and God wants to be there with us to share it. He gives us the power of the Holy Spirit to move with it and do all kinds of great things. But in order to move properly in it, we have to not just put it out there haphazardly. We need to have a, we need to be united around something. We need to have a, a purpose for us. And over the next three weeks, I'm going to talk about each of these three C's. And then we're going to take a, a week off of our missions convention. But you know what? If you're going to serve the heart of God in missions, you've got to know these three C's as well. And then October 8th, we're going to have a, a unique service. Now, you might wonder what a unique service is. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, it's going to be a short service. You're going to learn a lot about yourself and about the other people in the congregation that day. And, at the end of, and we're going to be done by 11 o'clock, I promise you. We're done at 11 o'clock, guaranteed. Because at 11 o'clock, everybody who wants to stay, we want to, we're, going to stop, we're going to just spend some time talking about where we want to go. Do these three C's resonate with you? If they do, let's implement them. If they don't, this is the time to tell me I'm, I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay? You know, we're, we're in this together. I'm, I'm not, I'm the chief servant. I'm not, I'm just here what God tells me to do. You know, I'm not here to tell you what to do. You want to hear what, what God has to say and say, does that resonate with you and your soul? Does it resonate where we want to go? And also today we're going to talk about how do we portray this to the community? I, I believe that we need to change our name in order to do it properly. I believe that we need to have our name along with some type of tagline behind it and say, this is what we are, what we do, how we do it. And so the three C's are caring for each person, connecting each story, and celebrating every miracle. And uh, so we'll talk about connecting and celebrating next week. Today we're going to be talking about caring for each person. Now, that was great. Hey, it's turned. Let's see if I broke it. Oh, I lost the battery. Uh-oh. I don't see it. Am I going that? Let me. All right. Okay. Uh, so Randy, can you run and get me a, a, a AAA battery to go with this? Because <laughs> I don't see it anywhere. And uh, if you're new here today, just so you know, I'm klutzy. Uh, it's just this is par for the course. This is this is not something like that's unusual. That that doesn't. If you're new here today, that you expect these things. It's just what what happens. And so today we're going to talk about, about, about caring for, for each person. Now that, that might sound simple. And now I have to stall because I can't do my next slide until I, until I get the battery. Uh, but you know, it sounds simple. We're like, you know, of course you're supposed to care for every single person. It's, it's of course we're supposed to do that. But you know what? Not everybody does. Because you know what? If everybody cared for every single person the way they should, the world would be a better place, would it not? If every Christian cared for everybody the way they should, there wouldn't be as many issues in churches, would there be? Wouldn't churches get along? Wouldn't they be able to do more? You know, there's 35 million people in this country that are in church this morning, on average, every Sunday morning. But yet, you know, this, Christ, this nation is not a Christian nation. Why is that? Because even the Christians fight among themselves, don't we? You know, who we care for, who we don't care for. And i got to stall for about another 10 seconds, I hope. Now I'm making Renda move faster. I'm putting the pressure on Renda. I mean, I really, I don't see it anywhere. I mean, I'm, I, could, I, I could be blind. Who knows? Under the, I, try, I looked underneath there. I don't, you'll find it, and that's okay. So now which way does it go? Oh, okay, I got it. You know what? I just realized something. It only has room for one battery. 
So I just may rent a good value for nothing. This should work. Yay, it does. All right. All right. Okay. Once again, this is not unusual, too. I look at things and see a hole and think there needs to be something. And I realize the hole is for the little chippy thing that goes in the computer that goes over here. So that's okay. But yeah, we're talking about caring for each person. And Jesus, he, he, he did that. He, he, he cared about every person, no matter who they were. He cared about children. That's something you need to care about. You know, that in, in, in the Bible, one day the children were brought to Jesus. And the disciples said, hey, you can't come bother the master. You know, you're not important enough. And what's Jesus say? Let them come. Let them come, for such is the kingdom of God. And he, and he prays over them. And then, and then Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, this story is kind of repeated. It says in, uh, in Acts 2.39, it says, For the promises for you and your children, all who are far off. And Peter's preaching about this. He's really meaning it's for the Holy Spirit is for everybody, even the children. Because you know what? He was rebuked a few months earlier for this thing. You know, God wants to minister to every single person. You don't got to be 45 years old in order to serve the Lord. You don't got to be 10 years old to serve the Lord. God wants to serve you no matter where you are. And also, just so you know, if you've waited your whole life to serve the Lord, guess what? It's not too late because you're still alive. God can still use you. God wants to use you. And you know what? He doesn't, he, he, he put them in a priority. The next thing is, you know, God also, he ministered to women. Now you might wonder why, what, what's the big deal about that? Back in the ancient days, women were not considered uh, a priority. They were not considered equal to men. They were not considered all these different things. So I'm talking about ancient days. Please don't put my politics in today. I'm not talking about today. Okay? I believe since the beginning of time, men and, equal, men, men and women were created equal. The, people, the Jewish people, they, they, they messed a lot of things up along the way. And, uh, and so he, he, he didn't forbid them to come to him. The first person he ever witnessed to in the Bible happens to be a woman. John chapter 4. And not just a woman, but, but she was, a, 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 for what most people would get, a, a terrible sinner. And then people were, were shunning her when the disciples saw her talking to her and said, Jesus, you know who you're talking to? You, you shouldn't talk to that person. They're going to think you're strange. Let me tell you something. Everybody's strange to some, some degree or whatever. But God talks to each and every one of us, and God loves each and every one of us. And says God also talks to the sick. You know, God didn't care. You know, we're supposed to care for everybody. You know what, you know, you know someone's sick, we, we care for them, we go visit them. But you know what, this sickness goes beyond just more than physical sickness. There could be relationship sickness, there could be financial sickness, there could be a personal uh, uh, depression inside them, all different things. And God says, you know, sometimes we see people like that and we avoid them. And God says, no, we need to care for them. God never turned anybody away. Jesus never turned anybody away who came to him. Others tried to turn them away. He even tried to get away from them, go out the other side. And they came and found them. Jesus didn't say, go away from me. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. Another thing he says is, you know, he cares for the sinners. You know, we got a lot of crazy people in the world. We got terrorists. The biggest one is ISIS today for right now. You have the crazy guy in North Korea. You have all the kind of things that are going on in the world. But you know what? You know, we're supposed to pray for them, aren't we? You know, what if the leader of ISIS got saved? What if the, what if the leader in Korea got became a Christian. You know, the influence he has over all the people in his country, man, what, what kind of great influence he could be. You know, one, you say one person, what can one person do? Imagine what one person there could do. You know, God can use anybody to do anything. But sometimes here, even in, in our own communities, we look at people with a certain eye because of what they've done or how they are or who they are. Jesus says, don't do that. We're supposed to care for each person. A lot of churches just care for, they want people to look just like them, talk like them, look like them. You know what? You don't want a church that looks like me and talks like me and walks like me. And you, you don't want that. Okay? All right? You have a bunch of people up here breaking stuff. That's just what will happen. That's what I do. I'm really good at breaking stuff. It's not a good, by the way, that's not a good thing to be good at. Just so you know. But you know, you know he, and GSC also, now, now, now a lot of people point to the Bible and says that he hang out with all these different people. But you know, he also hung out with, he hung out with, with the elite. You know? And in our society, these people we consider elite people. You have the president. You have uh, an actor who plays 007. You have LeBron James. You have, uh, you have uh, Bill Gates. Some, most of your room summers should, should, should relate to most of them. Today happens to be the day football season starts. In this area of the world, this person's kind of elite. Right? How many, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. How many of you want, make sure, want to make sure I'm done by 1 o'clock, right? You know, you know, Carmen said, you know, you know, about being done by 12, worry about your pot roast. Some of you might be worried, is he going to get done in time for the game? Trust me, I'm going to get done in time for the game. Okay, well, I'm going to be done. Now, whether God's done in doing what he's going to do, 
Different story. We go on that. But you know, you know, he hung around with Joseph of Arimathea. He was a ruler. Nicodemus came to him by night. You know, Luke, he was a doctor, and he wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And Acts is probably the most important book as a Christian because it talks about the early church and how the church is supposed to be, how it was always supposed to be. And, and people say, I, I, I want to get back to that. Well, you know, that's an important book. And he used an elite person to, to write that book. Jesus hung out with everybody, anybody, didn't matter who they were, even among his 12 disciples. Now, there's a misconception about his 12 disciples. Most people think they were all poor fishermen. They weren't. We don't know about all of them, but we know about a few of them. We know that Peter and Andrew, they, 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 were, they were poor fishermen. They, they struggled day to day. But the sons of Zebedee, the other fishermen they were called, they're a little bit different. It says in Mark chapter 1, verse 20, that they worked with their father and they had hired servants who went out and did the fishing for them. So that means they were owners. They weren't just fishermen. They were the owners of the fisher, of, of the people. And they sent out hired servants to go out and do the job because they had got to a place in life where they were a little bit more secure. They were owners. And you had Matthew, who was a, a tax collector. And he was probably in the, in the middle of society, but he also was hated because he was working for the Romans. He was considered a traitor because he was taking taxes from the Jewish people and giving them to their oppressors, the Romans. And he was working for them. And, and you know, he was considered a, a terrible person, but yet Jesus called him to be one of his 12 apostles. We don't know about the others. And then we get to heaven, it'll be very interesting to find out what all they, each of them did. The find that all came from different walks of life, different areas of life. Because Jesus is not a respecter of anybody. It says in James 2, chapter 1, it says this, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with a gold ring, fine apparel, and should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there or sit here at my footstool, and have, not, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? God's saying here, you know what? It doesn't say you shouldn't pay attention to the guy with the gold and the fine dress and all that stuff. But it says you should treat everybody exactly the same. If you give the guy with the fine stuff a good seat, you should give the guy with nothing the same thing as well. You should give your love to everybody equally. That's what God is saying. He's saying you should not show partiality to anybody because you know what? You have no idea what they've been in life. You have no idea where they are. But you know what? God treats everybody the same. You might, well, why does this guy have this and why do I have this? Because God needs you there, needs this guy there, needs this here. When we get to heaven, though, if you follow God, great is your reward. It will never go away. Your focus has to be on what God is going to give you, not on what is happening in the here and now. Now, I wanna, I'm going to go on a little tangent right now because uh, something I think that is a... A misnomer in churches is treated something we got to understand. When I came here last summer, one of the things is I called around uh, and I called everybody that was here at the time, and or I met with them at lunch, or I had a meeting. I, tr I tried to get to everybody and get a little bit of their opinion about church and how things are. And one of the things I heard above everything else about the church, the biggest negative thing I heard was this. Anyone take a guess? So let's have a C. Communication. Yeah, I heard a little bit about that. There were too many clicks. clicks. There you go. Anybody know? Everybody know what a click is? Okay, no one's raising their hand. No one knows what a click is. I, I, you know, you going like this, and me up here in the lights. I don't see all your heads. Okay. <clears throat> you guys assume Pastor knows a lot more than he knows. Okay, that's a dangerous thing here. But you know what? Clicks. A click is simply a group, small group of people associated with one another. And, uh, and one of the things says, you know, you need to get rid of the cliques in the church. And I heard that a lot. You know what? What you got to understand is I want to talk to you about something today. Because the reason why people want to get rid of the cliques is the way the world views cliques. The way the world views cliques is simple. This, a group of people get together because they like one another. And what they do is they put down everybody else or don't let anybody else in their group. Or, or they, they, they look down someone else. Or they come together because people look down on them. And, and it's really an animosity thing where we're our group and you're your group. And we don't want to associate with you. We don't want to be with you. Blah, 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 blah. The worldly view of click, you know, and you, you, you look down. You get a group together that can look down on somebody else. You know what? And, and, and that's, that's, that is wrong. But let me tell you something. Clicks are going to happen because we as humans tend to gravitate towards certain other humans. Just the way it is. 
Just the way God made us. We all have different ways that we operate. You know, some of us, you know, get along better with these and get along better with them and don't get along so well with them and don't get along so well with them. That's okay because, you know, God made you the way you are. If you want to look for a church that doesn't have a clique, you're not going to find it unless the church is like 12 people. Okay? All right? Because then you could have one clique, you know? All right, and, and, and still in 12, you might still find a click. Okay, you might find two opposite things. And, and the thing is, you know, clicks aren't bad because you know what? You need fellowship, or you need small groups of people because guess what? You cannot fellowship with all 125 of us that are, that are in this church at the same time. It's just not possible to have a relationship with all that. It, the time isn't there. You know, I, I would love to have an intimate relationship with every single one of you in this room, but there's only so many hours in a week. And there's things I got to get done. And I have a family. And I have, we all have those things in our lives. And so God intentionally created us certain things in certain ways. And we like certain things and don't like certain things. And that's, oh, it's not a bad thing to have clicks. And I might say, okay, well, where, where are you going with this? But here's the difference our clicks can't be like the world's clicks. You know, even Jesus had a click of 12 that he confided to. But then what did he do with those 12? He sent them out to anybody. And that's what we have to be. We can have our own groups. We can have those type of things. And it's not showing partiality. It's just because people we like to fellowship with. But here's the difference in the church world is, we don't have a click to say, we're better than you. We don't have a click to, because, well, they, they're, they're oppressing us. Or we don't, we're not forming a click to make somebody else feel bad because they're an outsider. That's what the world clicks do, don't they? Christian cliques, because they're going to happen. You know, in the Christian world, we have, we have a name for cliques. They're called small groups. Isn't that the definition? But the idea is, worldly cliques are inward focused. Christian cliques are small groups or fellowship. It's supposed to be outwardly focused. Instead of looking down on somebody who's on the outside, say, how can we help that person? Maybe they don't fit our group, but let's make them feel welcome and, and find a group for them. Or find something. For, or maybe break away from our clique and intentionally go start another one with them. Because you know what? We're always looking how we can build one another up. And we don't care who they are, how much money they have, how little they have, what they look like, what kind of clothes they have, how tall they are, if they're skinny like me. Thank you. Let me show you your way because if you didn't laugh, you were all sleeping because, you know... I am a relatively non-skinny person. We'll just leave it at that. But, you know what? So a healthy church is not a church without cliques. A healthy church is one that says, hey, we're going to have groups. Because you're going to need people you need to lean on. You need to have someone you can confide in. You need small groups to be involved in where you say, hey, if I need something, I can go to this person, have a prayer partner with this person. We're not supposed to be out in the ocean all alone. But at the same time, you... If you want to have a relationship with every single person in this room, look around. It's not really possible. Go ahead and try it. And tell me if you still have a job. Okay? I mean, you, you, you have things you got to do. If you have a family, you have certain things you got to do. But you know, we should always be looking and say, hey, if someone isn't fitting in, hey, we're not going, ha ha. We're going, hey, I need, that person needs help. What can we do as a group? What can I do as an individual? We're always looking to be inclusive, not exclusive see worldly cliques are exclusive christians we're supposed to always be inclusive does that make sense and so you know it's just something you know i hear it all the time in all kinds of churches and people looking for a church there's one thing here above everything else well your church has cliques well guess what we do but we need to do it right we need to do it the way god intended us to do it God created you a certain way to fellowship with certain things, and you're going to have better fellowship with others than others. But never make your group just exclusively your group. Always look to how you can include someone else, or how I'm going to, if someone is hurting, we can reach out to them. You know what happens? A lot of churches, they have certain cliques, and they're like, well, I'm not going to help them. I'm, I'm glad they're, they're, they're doing terrible. Really? That's the way a church is supposed to be? That's the way the world is. That's why the world doesn't work. That's why there's all kinds of problems in the world because the world's all about getting smaller and, in, and, and in, inward focused rather than being outward focused, caring about 
every single person. So now I'm kind of off that. We're going to go on to the next thing. We're going to talk about this word caring. And the root word is care and what, and what it has to be for us today. And the first thing we get to, as we get to it, yeah, here we go. I'm going to, I'm going to divide into the acronym, C-A-R-E. And we're going to talk about what each letter does. And each letter builds upon other. Just like this word care, you know, if you take out the word A, you don't get a word at all, do you? C-R-E is not a word that I know of. You take out R and you just still don't get a word. You, all four of these come together. In order to care properly, you've got to do all four. The problem is a lot of people in the world and even Christian circles only get some of these, some of these right. They don't get the full care package. And we need to present the full care package. That's what God does for us. And so anyone take a guess what the first C is? You're allowed to talk to me. I won't point you out and say that's stupid. Compassion! Hey, we got on the first try. Compassion. You know, the first thing is we got to have compassion. It makes sense, right? If you're going to care for somebody, you must be compassionate. It means you feel something toward the other person. Anybody know a trivia question? Anybody know what the shortest verse in the Bible is? Jesus wept. Anybody know where it's found? Now, we always know the, short, the words. John eleven thirty five. 35, it says, Jesus wept. Now, it's a trivia question. We know it's a very important verse. Because this story, what happens is Lazarus died. And Jesus is going to see Lazarus. Another point where, where he, he, he kind of bucks the rules. Because instead of going to the men of the household, he goes to Mary and Martha first to talk to them about what happened to their brother. And, and he's there and Lazarus has died. And he gets to the tomb of Lazarus and, and says, Jesus wept. It's a powerful verse because this shows that Jesus feels. It's not a trivia answer. Jesus wept is extremely powerful because it shows that Jesus feels. And if he wept for Lazarus, when he talks in the Bible where where God weeps over us, or God is joyous over us, or God is angry at us, guess what? This verse is the proof that those things are not made up words, they're not some type of, you know, well, it's not really what it is exactly what it means because when Jesus wept over Lazarus, he was crying. He had wept over Lazarus. It's a powerful verse. Because Jesus has true compassion. And it goes on, it says in Luke 7, 13, this is one of 15 verses, the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, he said, do not weep. You know, there's all kinds of verses. When the crowds came to him, he had compassion on them and healed their diseases. He had compassion on him and cast out the thing. There's 15 verses that mention the word compassion with Jesus Christ. There's also probably up to 100 verses that infer the compassion of Christ. And you know what? And Jesus felt great compassion toward everyone simply because they were humans who needed a Savior. It wasn't just because they needed something done right there and then. But they needed a Savior he knew by doing what he did would bring them to realization that he was what they had been searching for their whole life. Or maybe needs a reason to stay with the Savior. Now sometimes we get saved and we've been in church forever, but we, is it really worth it? You know what? We need to show compassion because you know a lot of people, they come to church and then they leave church just as fast as they came. And why? Because they, don't have, they, need to have, they need to know there's a feeling behind it. That they feel what's going on. That this person, does this church have compassion, true compassion? Not just say it, but actually feel it deep down inside of them. And Jesus felt the needs of the people. Aren't you glad he feels your needs? He doesn't just hear your needs. He feels them. You know, there's a big difference between hearing about somebody and feeling something what you hear. Because you feel something, you're more apt to act upon it. And we as a church need to do so as well. We need to have compassion. But compassion is no good without the A. Anyone want to guess what the A is? Act. Good, but no. What? Authentic. Authentic. That's a good one. Not quite. Attitude. All right, well, the word I got is attentive. And it kind of gives a lot of authentic attitude. Those are the words come into it. Because you know what? You can have compassion, but if you're not paying attention to the person, what does your compassion mean? Absolutely nothing. You know, if you go to somebody and you, you put your guts out and you pour out to them and they're not even listening, 
You can say you're compassionate, but guess what? You just betrayed it right by the fact of how you responded to it. It goes from, you go from compassion to even pity or worse. It says, I don't even care about you. No, Jesus was attentive. You know, you have the story here. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today. I must stay at your house. This is a story in the Bible about a guy named Zacchaeus. Kids sing a little song about him. Zacchaeus was a, anybody know? Wee little man and a wee little man was he. You know, he was a man of very small stature. But he had heard about Jesus. He was desperate to see him. He just wanted to get a glimpse of who this person was because he had believed that Jesus was who he said he was and he couldn't see because of the crowd. So what did he do? He climbed up a sycamore tree and he got up on top of the tree and he was looking and Jesus saw him there. You might think this is just an unimportant story in the Bible. Let me tell you something. If it's in the Bible, it is important. Jesus saw Zacchaeus' desperation. He was attentive to what was going on, and he was attentive to how Zacchaeus was pouring out, saying, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get to know who this Jesus was. And what Jesus does? He says, I'm going to come to your house. This next one here. Nevertheless, lest we offend him, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened his mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to him for me and for you. What's going on here is, is, is the story... Peter is asked by the, by, by the, by the temple guards, the, 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 the temple collectors, and said, hey, do you and your master pay, pay taxes to the temple? You pay the temple tax. You know what Peter said? Of course we did. Did they? No. Jesus comes in the room. Peter comes in the room and says, hey, what are you talking about? Oh, nothing. Peter's like, no. Jesus is like, no. Did you tell him? What would you tell him? Peter's like, well, I... They want to know if we paid the temple tax. I assured them that we did. And Jesus is like, uh, you, you know we didn't. So Jesus says, go out, cast out there, bring a fish, and inside the fish you'll find a shekel and go pay the t- temple tax for you and for me. And why? Lest we what? Offend them. You see, Jesus was conscious about what was going on around him. He was conscious that people viewed what was going on. He was conscious of world events and things like that. He was conscious of what was going on. He was attentive to what people thought about because it could affect the message. As the church, we need to show compassion. We also need to be attentive. Last week, we did a great job of giving over $400 to help victims in Hurricane Harvey. This weekend, there's another hurricane coming to uh, Florida, uh, Hurricane Irma. Um, and, and, you know, you have all these things, you know, but as a church, we need to be attentive to the needs that are out there. We need to be attentive to, to what, our, what the world's going on, but also to our community. Jesus understood where he was at, and, and not paying a temple tax would offend people. He understood his community. He understood what he had to do to make his witness sure. A lot of churches, they just care about what's going on inside their church and not really care about what's going on outside. We need to be attentive to what's going on. Over the next six, seven months when we talk about these things we adopt, and we need to look at ways to say, how can we be attentive you know, that's why we change the food bank to where it is. We want to be more attentive to what they really need, really want. Uh, t- we're we're, we're get, getting close to getting to that point. Uh, I have a meeting tomorrow with somebody um, that Brother Mike is set up with. What's his name? Scott Grinder. And it's about a mentoring thing and helping deal with the, basically keeping kids off of drugs and doing something. And, and hopefully it'll spar from there. It's something we might do as a church. We have a beautiful building. We have a great facility. Why don't we, we should use it more, shouldn't we? I'm not sure where it's all going to go, but you know, that's a problem in our town. It's a problem across our nation. I mean, I was talking to, uh, where's brother Mike? Uh, Roger. Oh, right, there you are. He was telling me up today, and uh, <clears throat> there was a guy who was supposed to come live in his house after he got paroled and didn't do the right things, and him and his brother are both, both they, 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 they live for the drug rather than living for, for what they should be living for, their family, and one has a kid and all this, and it's a sad thing. It's an epidemic. But, you know, we need this. But we can't just say we're against it. We've got to find ways that make sense to help stop the problem from happening in the first place. And, and why we do different events, why we do things. We've got to be attentive to the needs. Jesus paid attention. And because he paid attention, his compassion showed through better. You know, why were people attracted to Jesus? Not because he gave these great compassionate speeches or said he was compassionate. Because not only was he compassionate, but he always noticed the people. You know what that does? That takes effort. A lot of people just like to live their own little world and hope and not worry. Oh, that's their problem. I'm not worried about it. 
You know, if we truly want to act like Jesus Christ is, we got to see the problems that are out there and say, we're going to take those problems on as our own. Not, we're not, we don't want the problems here, but we're going to be the, we're going to help be the solution to it. Because Jesus Christ is the solution to every single problem there ever was. You know what? We might not be able to solve every problem. And that's why there's more than one church in the world. But God's going to give us things to do that we can solve certain problems and then bring the problem solver into their life, Jesus Christ, that can help them with any other problem that comes into their life. So in a community, we need to find out what it needs and not guess about it. In this world, in the nation, and everywhere. But however, to prove you're attentive, you have to do something else. Anybody know what the other, the next letter is? Respond, yes. You can be, you can have all the compassion you want, and you can be, you can be attentive and all get out, but if you don't do anything, you just eliminate the first two. <clears throat> Faith without works is dead. Now many, you know, you know, many people point to that and say, you know, we, it's a great verse of Bible. I'm going to read it here real quick. What does it profit, my brother, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of his daily food, and one of you says, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, and do not give them the things which they are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. How do you respond? This passage here, James is speaking, he's saying, you know, if a brother or sister comes to you and says, they need food and they need clothing, and you just say, oh, we'll pray for you, brother, and just let some on the way, have you actually done anything for them? No. You know, one of the, I think one of the worst things as a church we do is, is we, we put this phrase out there way too much, I'm praying for you. You know, it, it, it sometimes is a Christian cop-out. And then do we actually do pray about it? And then sometimes if we pray for them, God will tell us to do something. And then we need to respond. You know, people need to see it. The lost and dying world, they're wondering, you know, is the church just this, this myth or this thing that just floats here? Is Jesus, you know what? Jesus responded every time he was asked. He was asked. You know, it, it, all kinds of different times in the Bible. He responded every single time. There was one time he was on the road. And these two blind men come up to him. And they said, David, have mercy on us. But Jesus asked him, what do you want done? It says, we're blind, we want to what? Hear, right? Just making sure you're, you're awake. If you nod your head to that one, we, you got, wake up now, please. We want to see! And what did Jesus do? He had compassion on him, it says. He was attentive. He listened to what they said, and then what did he do? He responded. He healed them. And the great thing is, is we believe in Pentecost. We believe we have the stuff. Remember I talked about the stuff. You know, we believe God can still do those things today. Because he says greater, we can do greater things than Jesus did. You know, he didn't say that for just to say it. He said he really believed. We can do those things if Jesus Christ moves inside of us. But the key is we got to what? We got to imitate Christ as best we can. That's the last two weeks we're about. Because you can't care like Christ if you're not wanting to imitate Christ. Another thing is, there were these ten lepers who came to Jesus to be healed. And Jesus, they said, hey, we want to be healed of leprosy. And Jesus said, okay, I healed you. And he healed them. And then nine of them left. And only one came back to say what? Thank you. You know, it's interesting. You know, a lot of times we don't respond so quickly because, well, what if they don't, what if they don't, they're not grateful for what we did? What if they take what we have and, and didn't do anything with it? Or, or what if they go back into the same thing? But what if one does come back and say thank you? You know, of those ten lepers, the one came back, he came back and thanked Jesus. I'm sure it was just not a thank you. I'm sure Jesus had a conversation with him. I'm sure that one leper came to know who Jesus Christ was. And he probably used his testimony. We might get to heaven to find out he, he saved thousands of people. You know, sometimes in, we, we don't respond well. Reason we say, I'm praying for you. We don't want to put our, we don't want to respond and put ourselves out there, whether it's our wallet or whether it's our time or energy or whatever it is. You know why? Because we're afraid it won't be reciprocated back to us. We have a question, is it worth it? Well, if you want to be like Jesus Christ, you got to say, it is worth it. Because he never turned any single person away. He wasn't mad that the other nine didn't come back. He just said, where were they? Weren't there ten of you? Where are the other nine? 
You know, what if he said, well, this, I'm only going to get one out of ten here to get, you're going to come back to me, so I, I'm just not going to heal any of the ten. You know, what if, if, if one is good enough for Jesus, it should be good enough for us, shouldn't it? But you know what the interesting part of the story is? When he healed them, he didn't know if one was going to come back or not. So how many were good enough for him? Zero. He put himself out there, not even knowing that there'd be a return at all. If you're going to respond and imitate Christ properly, that's how you've got to respond, whether there's a return or not. Because you never know when there will be a return. Sometimes you might get a return of one. Sometimes you're going to get a return of zero. Sometimes you're going to get a return of ten. Then there might be that one day you get a return of a thousand. But if you don't respond, you'll never get a return ever. Because <clears throat> you know what? There's one last thing Jesus did when he responded. He also did this, right? The ultimate thing he responded to, he had compassion on us. That's why he came down to earth, right? And he was attentive because he, he knew people were looking for the way. They just couldn't find it. And he, he knew what they needed. And he died on the cross with not one guarantee in the world anyone would ever accept what he did. Remember on the cross, how many people were still following him at that point? What well, says all 12 apostles scattered, right? His 12 best friends, three and a half years, seen all the miracles, all this, all that, and how many show up for the crucifixion? One. And he still had doubts, because it says that until, in John chapter 20, until after he was resurrected, none of the apostles really believed what was going on. It's an amazing thing. People think the apostles believed the whole time. They didn't believe until afterwards. Until they put their hand in the side and their finger in the, in, in the holes. By the way, it's not just Thomas who has to do that. The other ones did too. If you read John chapters 20 and 21. Jesus died on that cross not knowing if anybody would accept it. But he responded, didn't he? The ultimate response. You can't take care of your sin. You can't keep the law. You can't keep up with it. Well, I'm going to respond to that. I'm going to give you the ultimate sacrifice. This will take care of everything for all time, forever and ever and ever. But I have no guarantee anybody will accept it. <clears throat> if Jesus can do that, we need to imitate him and be willing to respond and say, I'm not going to worry about how it affects me. I'm going to do it because you know what? You never know how it might affect somebody else. Amen. I think that holds a lot of churches back. You know me, you see me here, I, I, I try a lot of different things. Some things I succeed in, some things I fail in. But you know what? I'm always going to try something. Because you know what? I never know when I'm going to hit the home run. I'm always a big believer I'm going to hit the home run on the next pitch. Because you know what? That's the kind of God I serve. And all I care about is affecting souls for the kingdom of God. Well, sometimes I fail, yeah, because I'm not God. You're not God either. What we do is we say, okay, that didn't work. Let's try something else. Until we find out what works and let God lead us in that direction. But we need to respond. But the response is no good if it's not done with the E. Anyone want to guess what the E is? Well, never mind. <laughs> never mind. See, I did it on purpose so you laugh. Yeah, right. You believe that? I got some land in Florida I want to sell you right now. I do, actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know what? It, the response is no good if it's not done where? With excellence. You know, you get this verse here. Matthew 16, 9 to 10. Do you not remember, do you not understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and the, how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves and the 4,000, how many large baskets you took up? This is talking about two stories in the Bible where people would come. 5,000 people came, men plus women and children, about fifteen to 20,000 people. And they had sat through Jesus' sermon and they, they, they were hungry. And Jesus said to the disciples, give them something to eat. And the disciples said, uh, we don't got anything. Send them away, Jesus. Let them go get something to eat. And a little lad comes along and says, hey, I, I, got, two, I got five loaves and two little fish. And Philip goes, what is that among so many? This also shows you the disciples didn't quite get it yet. 
Jesus takes it, blesses it, and passes it out. And after they're done, 12 baskets are taken up. Then a little later on, there's 4,000 people come together, plus women and children, about 10 to 12,000 people. And the same situation happens. They're, they need food, and disciples say, send them away again. And they kind of forgot about, wait a second. And, some, and then what comes on this time around was a few small fish and seven loaves of bread. And it's actually more food this time. Jesus, we, we can't do this. You know, they just didn't get it. Jesus prayed, blessed it, passed it out, and seven baskets were taken up. Now, you might say, okay, that's a simple story. How does that deal with excellence? Well, if you read both stories, it says they were eight till they were, anybody know? Full. Not satisfied. I mean, you can be satisfied. When you eat to your full, it means you've eaten past the satisf- satisfaction point. Okay? All right, you can eat to your full and all that, but, you know, you, you get that, and like for me, you know, a box of Oreo cookies and a big glass of milk. You know, three cookies, I'm satisfied. Whole box, I'm full. And there's a difference between satisfied and full. Satisfied is good. Full is not always so good. Okay? That's why I'm not so skinny anymore. All right, so we go on. But you know what? But it says they ate till they were full. It means they kept eating. And why would you keep eating? Now, remember, it was two small fish and loaves that were kind of older because the boy had them all day. And they weren't fresh. The other one was a couple small. I mean, these weren't like big trout or something. Just little itty bitty fish they got from the thing. They were probably feeder fish. But they ate till they were full. So what's that tell you about the food? Oh, more than that. Yeah, it must have been good. Now think about this. If the food's bad, you don't typically eat till you are. And now you ever go to someone's house and they serve something you really don't like? You just eat enough to bare minimum to get yourself out of there, right? Right? Who's ever done that? If your hand ain't up, you're lying to me. I haven't met anybody who hasn't been in that situation. You do not eat to your full. You eat to your point where your 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 person you're at is satisfied if you tasted their food. You know, when I was at Diana, Texas, and I was the pastor there, every first uh, Sunday night we had a potluck. And you know what? And, and we only had about thirty people, so it was a little easy to do. You know, everybody come ask me, "Did you try what I brought?" Because I was the pastor. Um. Just so you know, we've got to make sure people from Diana might watch this. We've got to figure out how we're going to edit this. So make sure Kevin, before he posts this, talks to me. Some of them can't cook. All right? And you know what? And so as pastor, I go around, I try everything. And the first time, you know, the first time, I just put a bunch of food on my plate. When you put food on your plate and everybody's watching you, you must what? Eat it. Eat it. At that point, I wasn't smart to figure out that you should probably test some things out before you go hog wild into it. It was the worst dinner I ever had. I smiled. Oh, yeah, Sister Magdalene, that was wonderful. Sister, you know, you know. And then I found out that the one person who I thought made the food, it was her husband who made the food. I'm like, oh, okay. Actually, his was really good. <clears throat> but uh, it, was, it was just interesting to see what was going on. And, and, and so after time, you know what I learned to do? When they brought a potluck, I, I learned, I had an idea who made what and what was this and what was that. And I would take a small portion of everybody's stuff. And then, hey, everything was good. But you know, you don't typically eat to your full unless the food is good. I'm going to tell you, I don't think the two small fish were the best of the bunch. They weren't sea bass. They weren't salmon. They weren't that. Okay? The bread had been out in the sun all day. It was not fresh. It was probably hard. It was probably yucky at that point of the day. But they ate till they were full because Jesus not only prayed for it, multiplied it, but it tasted good. Because when Jesus did something, he always did something in excellence. And the other thing he did in excellence is what? This here, huh? He was the most excellent sacrifice. And why is he the most excellent sacrifice? Because it was done once for all. It doesn't have to be done over and over and over again. You only had to do it once, and it covers all sin. And the neat thing about it is, you don't have, the thing changed from you having to do this over and over again to, it's 
Oh, and if you do something over and over again, God will still forgive you. It never runs out of the power to atone for your sin. Isn't that wonderful? Remember, I told you a couple weeks ago, the devil's the one who makes you feel bad. God never wants to make you feel bad. He wants you to make you feel right. Sometimes he has to convict to do certain things, but his goal is to make you feel right, to be righteous. You know what? And he went beyond that, too. Because not only did he, did he do that on the cross, but then he sent us the Holy Spirit so we can do the things that he did. To every single gift in the, whole, in, the, in the Bible is available to us, to our access, to show the power and the glory of God, because God does things well. And we as Christians need to do that. Because you know what? You can have all the compassion you want. You can, have all, you can be attentive as you want. And you can respond all you want. But it's all undone if you respond in a haphazard way or not give it your best. Jesus Christ, we died on the cross. He gave us his absolute best. So what does God expect from us? Our best. But what do we like to do sometimes? Well, we'll do it kind of haphazard and hope it works out, and, and then we'll see if we do some more later on. That's not what God asks. He wants you always to give of your best. I believe it's time for us to know who we are and be able to tell others. But we also got to live it because it does no deal. We can say we're a caring church. We connect with every story. We'll talk about it. We celebrate every miracle. But if we don't actually understand what it is and actually do what it is, it's just a bunch of talk. And unfortunately in this world, there's a lot of Christians who have a bunch of talk, but nothing backing it up. We want God to move in power. We want the Holy Spirit to show up on a regular basis. We got to do things the right way. And the first thing is God cares for everybody. Because you know what? Jesus cares for every single person. What's the C? Compassion. What's the A? Are you attentive to me today? What's the R? Respond. And what's the E? Excellence. You got to have them all. You know what? Jesus cares for every single person. He has compassion on everybody. He's attentive to every single person. He responds to every single need. And trust me, he does. You say, well, he hasn't responded. Well, are you sure? And when he does respond, he does it with what? Excellence. I like acronyms because it helps us remember things. You know, we need to live that way because we are to imitate Christ. Aren't you glad Jesus did all those things for you? Shouldn't we do the same? And there's two things this world responds to. It responds to hate and true caring. Those are the two things people respond to. Hate's the easy one because it doesn't take a lot of effort. It doesn't, does it? It does not take a lot of effort to not like somebody. It doesn't take a lot of effort to get on a soapbox and rail against somebody. It doesn't take a lot of effort to go and march and do something and say, this is what we really, you're terrible, and you not listen to the other. It doesn't take a lot to hate. And the world responds to that, and what does hate do? It, it leads to never-ending disaster. Look at our world today. It ain't getting any better. The other thing the world responds to is caring. It's harder. It takes effort. It takes intentionally thinking to do it. Not easy, is it? But you know what it leads to? Changes for the better. People's lives being changed. It doesn't open you to being hurt because people might not respond. People, the haters are still going to hate. You know, but you think you're going to change that, you're not going to change that. People, you, but you know what, you can change one at a time. Because if people really understand caring, they gravitate to that. That's what they gravitated to Jesus, because he didn't just say he cared. He was caring, he was attentive, he responded, and he did it in excellence. <clears throat> because when we care for others, no matter who they are, others then are drawn to us, and they're drawn to the message that can save them from hell 
and give them eternal life in heaven. And that's what it's about. We're here 70, 80, 90 years, maybe 100. But we're in eternity, one in place or the other, forever. Forever's a whole lot longer. So I, I want to I end with a, a video. Um, now, before you think this is some type of conspiracy, I do need you to kind of move forward a little bit because it's not in English. But it translates really well. If you want to see the English words on the bottom, I, couldn't, I can't make them any bigger and, and you see the video. But the... Yeah. Hey, all right. Woo. We should have one of these on order just as a backup. Um, but this story is a powerful story about how this person was carrying a tent of and then what happens at the end. And See, the story is talking about this, this, this shop owner. He, he just, he didn't just care. He, he saw the need. He had compassion on the boy. He listened to the boy. Is your mom sick? And he responded. Not only just respond and get the medicine, he, he, if he couldn't have money for medicine, probably didn't have food. Gave him even more than that. <clears throat> you know what happened? Then 30 years later, it gets returned to him. Why? Because true caring breeds true caring. It's what the world responds to. And Jesus Christ did what he did. He had no expectation. That guy had no expectation that one day he'd fall and hurt his head and need massive surgery. No idea that would happen. But he did it anyways because that's what Jesus would do. He 
He showed compassion. He was attentive. He responded. And he did it in the most excellent way he could. You know what? We're looking for God to do something great here. I want God to do something great here. Actually, I'm not looking for it. I demand it. I don't want to be just some church that just goes through space and time. I, I want to see something great happen. I want to do everything the Bible says I can do. I want to do all the things that God says a church can do. It starts with the first principle. We need to get together and understand that what caring is. As you know what, kind of the story, the old man, also when I was preparing this message, God said, the old man kind of represents Jesus. In our world today, what Jesus really did is kind of, is on his deathbed. How many people have changed the story of Jesus into so many different things? Oh, it's just a social gospel. Oh, well, you know, he, it, it, you know, he, he doesn't demand this from me. He doesn't want, everybody's tried to water it down to the point where it's like, you know, he's not even in the center and, you know, it, it's, it's, it, there's more people than just Jesus and there's other things and, You know what Jesus is telling us today is, you know what? We can pay it back to Jesus by caring for others the way he cares for us. And why did we do that? Because it was all paid for 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary with one man who shed his blood for us, who had no reason whatsoever to do that. But he did it because he loved us. And because he had compassion on us. He heard our cry. He responded and in the most excellent way. So I want you to dwell on that this week as we talk about that. Next week we're going to talk about the next scene. Then the next scene after that. And then I'm going to give you a week, or two weeks off to kind of let these percolate inside your brain. But you know what? It's... it's so many times we respond immediately to something. You know, we should take time. God says, let's reason together. He gave you your brain to think about it. What does this mean in your life? Not just in the church, because it has to affect your life individually first before it can affect the church as a body. That's a very important concept. A lot of people are, well, let's see what the church does. No, no. Let's see what you do first. And then the church comes together and does something. We're We're, we're individuals. And we need to let it percolate inside of us. Because you know what? There's a lost and dying world out there. And to be 100% honest, the message of Jesus Christ is, also, is becoming a lost and dying message as well because people have watered down to the point where it doesn't mean what it's supposed to mean. Well, yeah, he's there, but he just loves you all. But he's not moving in power and all these problems. Well, I mean, just limp along to heaven. That's, that's not the Jesus I serve. And let's see what he can do. But well, we got to imitate Jesus Christ. Last two weeks we talked about party. Now we're talking about how to live our life. What's the C? What's the A? What's the R? What's the E? Okay, that was about 40% of you by the end. I'm, I'm, now you, you might laugh at that, but you know what? We either got to believe it or we don't. Right? If you want to see something great done, you either live it or you don't. That's the problem with Christianity. We want to just live a certain way and hope things happen. God says, no, he doesn't, you're not just gambling. If you do certain things a certain way, certain things will happen. That's what God says. But it takes effort. That's why there's so much hate in the world, because it doesn't take any effort to hate somebody. And the interesting thing is when you hate somebody, you feel terrible about it. And you want, it messes with your life. Not only does it destroy the person you're hating, usually the hater gets destroyed themselves. But when you care for somebody, it takes a lot of effort, but you know what? You feel so great about yourself. You know what? Why wouldn't you? Because you're living like Jesus Christ. Let's say it together. What's the C? What's the A? What's the R? What's the E? Now take that and let that percolate inside of you. What's that mean in your life? And then see how God translates that into something else.
Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for bringing us here to church today. Lord, we thank you for just all of us that are here, Lord, and how you want to do something great in this body of believers. And Lord, we just want to get closer to you. We know as we imitate you, we can do so many great things. And Lord, the thing we need to do first and most is you got to make sure that we care the way you care. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.